participants uh, in this online seminar. It is a, a, a privilege for me and a delight to be the inaugural speaker at the launch of the Collaborative Learning Cafe by the Friends of the Jesuits. This is really a marvelous idea, and these are the silver linings of the pandemic. Things which we never thought were possible have uh, become possible, have forced us into, into, in, into doing things online, and these are one of the advantages. Of course, it comes with its disadvantages. Speaking on a stage is always so much easier because you can see the audience, you can judge their reactions, you can you, you, you know when they are getting bored and when they are interested. Uh, but actually now uh, all I'm doing is looking at a computer screen and this makes things more difficult. But anyway, let, let's, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, I'm going to be speaking to you on a career in the IAS, prospects and challenges. Now know that among you are um, some people who actually uh, would like to consider joining the IAS as a career, but there are lots of people here who are already in their own careers, and uh, but they just want to know more about the IAS. They want to understand what this is all about. And so I'll try and direct my talk to satisfy uh, both uh, categories of people. I will not go into nitty gritty of career gather seminar directed principally at those who want to join the IAS, but I will talk more generally on what the IAS is. I will first tell you what, what this strange animal called the IAS is, its background and you know what it does, how, how is it set up, how is it constructed, and then some of the challenges that IAS officers face. And then, of course, we'll touch upon the IAS as a career choice and, you know, the exam, things like that, just very, very briefly. Uh, what is the IAS? Now, the history of this service actually goes back a long time. It goes back 270 years to 1757, uh, when the, it, it wasn't a double and it started, it was the service of a, the East India Company. And in 1757, after the Battle of Plassey, when the East India Company won the right of Diwani, the right of Diwani was the right to collect land revenue. I mean, in those days, there was no income tax, there was no customs and excise and other taxes. And the only source of revenue to, uh, to a government was land revenue, what we call Predial in Goa. So land revenue, the collection of land revenue was extremely important. It's called Diwani, otherwise called Diwani in Urdu. And the East India Company, after winning in the Battle of Plassey, got the right to collect land revenue and so began appointing officers to collect this land, land revenue. And naturally, the people who collected the land revenue were called collectors. And to enable them to do this, they were given all kinds of powers, all kinds of, you know, coercive powers to collect this land revenue. Uh, this went on for almost a hundred years, till 1855, when the much maligned Macaulay, and you many, you, you know, you've seen all those fake WhatsApp messages that go around about Macaulay's minute and things like that. Anyway, Macaulay recommended in 1855 that this manner of selecting people is uh, to, to, to do this job is, is actually uh, not correct. And it sh people should be selected on merit because apart from just collecting revenue, they are now doing so many things, you know, so many functions they are performing. And this coincided with the 1857 revolt after which the East India Company was set aside and the British government took over the government of India. And for the first time, the Indian civil service was organized properly and people were selected based on merit. But of course, called the Indian Civil Service, but there was nothing, they, it was just because it was, they, they worked in India, but it was open only to, to Britishers to join, and the examination was held in, was, was held in London. Uh, it took a long time from 1858 right up to 1886, when for the first time, Indians were allowed to sit for the exam. 
for the ICS, the Indian Civil Service. But any Indian wanting to sit for the exam had to travel to London to sit for the exam because the exam was held only in London. And then in 1922, for the first time, the exam began to be held in India as well as in, in London. And that went on till independence. And in independence, after independence, after 1947, the, the Indian Civil Service was then called uh, the, the uh, Indian Administrative Service. And for the first examination for the IAS was then held in 1948. Now, uh, what is important to understand is that the, the fulcrum of the job of the IAS officer has always been the district. All functions came on later, but the fulcrum was the district. Now, districts, strangely enough, many people imagine that the district was crea the creation of the British, which is not true. District administration in India goes back to Sher Shah Suri, and in fact, the head of the district was then called a district was a Subha, and the head was called Subedar. And Subedar was a very important person in those days. He managed the, the, the districts. And the districts, many districts that were created by Sher Shah Suri, even the borders of those districts remain unchanged today after 500 years. So district administration has been a way of running this country for five centuries. Now, initially, naturally, the job of the ICS, the Indian Civil Service, during the colonial time was one, law and order, because then, of course, other avenues of, of uh, revenue uh, began accruing to government. Various other taxes came into being. So now the collection of taxes was not the important job, though the the, 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 the uh, designation of collector continued, but law and order was the primary was the primary responsibility. The second was land management, and so all land revenue, land records, and all the jobs that you know that you, that, that you deal with, that you go to the Mandatar for, and things like that. The whole of land administration and infrastructural development, economic development as we know it today in post-independent India giving jobs to people, dealing with their health. These things were not so important in colonial times. But yes, infrastructure development, laying down of roads and waterways and the railway lines and things. So these were the three great responsibilities of the IS, of the ICS officer. But after independence, all this changed. In fact, at independence, there was a great demand that the ICS be disbanded. Because many of the ICS officers were responsible to put freedom fighters in prison. Naturally, their job was, was law and order. And during the freedom struggle, many of them had to do that. But Sardar Patel, our first home minister, said in parliament, when the constitution was being framed after the independence, that the ICS is the steel frame of India. And if we get rid of the ICS, he said, this country will not last two years. The country will disintegrate. It is the ICS that will keep this country together. And this was the famous speech he made on the 21st of April, 1948, in Parliament, uh, when the Constitution was being framed. And therefore, 21st of April is celebrated each year as Civil Services Day. And so, this in India, perhaps, is the only country where reference to its civil service and to its all India service is made in the constitution, Article 310, 311, 312. They talk about the Indian administrative service and the all India services. The, the permanent bureaucracy has constitutional protections and the bureaucracy, we call it the permanent bureaucracy, the permanent executive, because we have the political executive, which is subject to elections and when if the government uh, uh, is changed in the elections, then the political executive changes, but the, 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 the permanent bureaucracy remains the same. And, and uh, But in order to assure this kind of, in order, because we have been given this permanence, there is also a strict rule relating to the political neutrality of the IAS and all the other civil services, of course. Now, 
When we refer to the IAS as well as to the IPS, that is the Indian Police Service and the Forest Service, we call them All India Services. What is the meaning of an All India Service? An All India Service is a service which is cadre based. We, every IAS officer and IPS officer and Forest Service officer belongs to a state cadre. You will be surprised that the central government, many people don't realize this, but the central government has no IAS officers of its own. Every single IAS officer from the cabinet secretary downwards, the secretaries to all the ministries, everyone in the central government belongs to some state cadre or the other. An IAS officer has to belong to a state cadre. And everyone goes on deputation at various times in their career. Well, everyone doesn't go, but if you opt to go and if the government makes you to go, you can go to the central government. But everybody in the central government is on deputation. So you go for a five-year deputation, then you return to your state. Now, why is this necessary? Why has this been thought of? There is a reason for this. The reason is that the first 10 years or 10, 12 years of your career, you spend in the field. Later on, you go to the secretariat. But all your work in the secretariat is because of the experience you gain in field administration. As your first posting is generally SBO, subdivisional officer, uh, then you become an additional collector. You may be working in tribal welfare, so you'll be a project officer, tribal welfare, like I was. Or you can be a commissioner of a municipal corporation in a, in a, in a city. Or you can be the CEO of the Zilla Panchayat in, in, in many oh, yeah, sure. states. Uh, which is, you know, the Zilla Panchayat is the is part of the Panchayat system in the, at, the, at the district level. And then you become collector, then you, you will be collector for three, four, five years in different districts. And uh, then after that, you can become commissioner uh, in various uh, areas. These are all field postings. So now the central government has no land of its own. There is no state attached to the central government. And therefore, in order to be able to do all your field postings, you actually have to belong to a state cadre. And once you are allotted that state cadre, it also means you have to study the language of the state because you work only in the language of the state. Now, Goa doesn't have a cadre of its own because it's too small to have a cadre. Well, you, you require at least 70, 80 IS officers in order to have a whole cadre distribution from the junior most to the chief secretary. But Goa has only about 30 IAS officers, so Goa is part of the UT cadre, the Union Territories cadre, even though Goa is a separate state. But the vast majority of states have their own cadre. So a state like Madhya Pradesh has a cadre of about 300 people, so also Uttar Pradesh will have 300. There are states which have 200, 250, like that. Some states have 150 officers, whatever. All over, in India, there are 4,000 IAS officers. There are 4,000 IAS officers. So, now, uh, 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 as I was saying, you, you, uh, in, the, in, in the state, you have to do your field. Yes, yeah. once you are allotted to a cadre, you have to learn the language. In fact, when I went to Madhya Pradesh, I was allotted Madhya Pradesh. Uh, in my, as an SDO, there wasn't even an English typewriter in office. Of course, those days there were no computers, there were typewriters. So all our work was done in Hindi, whether it was my court work, whether it was passing judgments. I had to learn Hindi and do it. If you were in Tamil Nadu, you had to learn Tamil. If you were in Karnataka, you had to learn Kannada. If you were in Kerala, you learned Malayalam. If you were in Punjab, a lot of Punjab cadre, you would have to learn Punjabi. All your work is done in the language of the state, and you have to learn the state-specific laws too, because there are some laws, the land revenue codes and things, which vary from state to state. And the, the state becomes then your, your area of working. Then as when you finish your 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 district level posts and all your field field posts, I'd say after the first 10, 12 years of your career, it's then when you go to the secretariat and you can go to the, the for the balance two thirds of your career. The first one third is spent in the field. Now based on your experience in your field, you are working in the in the secretariat. Now in the secretariat, the state secretariat and the central government. So you go on deputation to the central government, go five years, come back, go. that kind of thing happens constantly. But in the secretariat, your job is policy formulation 
and monitoring what is happening in the field because the junior officers will continue to do things in the field but the secretariat has to monitor you have to help the government form its policy and you and an IAS officer advises advises the the, the ministers uh, uh, on action ad advice which they can take or, or advice which which they need not take uh, but IAS officers themselves don't rule the country you see that is a misconception because we live in a democracy and in a democracy whether you like it or not it is the it is the MP and the MLA who goes every five years or earlier to the people asking for a mandate the IAS officer doesn't go asking for votes his job is secure so ultimately in a democracy it is not the bureaucracy that has to rule but respecting a democracy it is it is uh, uh, the, the the government that rules but the IAS assists the government in in uh, in doing this okay now uh, uh, the questions arise as to what are the challenges that an IAS officer faces uh, Sardar Patel had said the IAS is the, the steel frame of the of the country uh, or only the cream are selected to the IAS but there are people who may be skeptics but who very validly ask is the steel frame now rusty or has this cream girdled? And, and 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 of course, you know, it it, it probably those those questions are extremely valid because you get all sorts. You get all sorts in the in the in the service. You know, there is this uh, thing which says that the, the the doctor and the engineer and a lawyer and a civil servant were arguing among themselves about whose profession was uh, was the most ancient. And the doctor said, you know, well, in Genesis it is written that, that, that God took uh, a rib from Adam and made Eve. Now, this clearly was a surgical procedure, and so the medical profession is the oldest. But the, 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 the scientist said, no, 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 before that God made the, the, the stars and the sun and the moon, and all this was certainly astrophysics. And so uh, the, 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 the scientist's profession is the, is, the, is the oldest. And the lawyer said, no, because the first thing that God did was from chaos, he made order. And that clearly was a legal act. And so the, the lawyer's profession is the most ancient. And the civil service only smiled and said, but who made the chaos? So. Uh, there are people who think that civil servants create chaos, but the, the, the IAS is a place where you can find all kinds of people. There are honest people, there are dishonest people, there are efficient people, and there are inefficient people. A colleague of mine liked to tell a joke saying, well, you know, in the IAS, there's place for everybody. If you're efficient, uh, you will rise to become secretary to the government. And if you're inefficient, you will rise to become cabinet secretary. So, of course, we say that tongue-in-cheek. But uh, anyway, so as I say, in the IS, you find all kinds of people. But what you have to understand about it is that it is a generalist service. It is a generalist service. There are, and in fact, that is a big criticism against the service. Many people say, you know, what are these IS officers doing? Uh, they are heading the health department. They know nothing because they are not a doctor. A doctor should be heading the health department or they head civil aviation, they know nothing, a pilot should be heading it, or they head uh, the, 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 the public works uh, public works department, the PWD, they're not engineers, so why should they be doing it? But you know, I mean, at one level, this seems to be uh, a valid criticism, but at another level, there are advantages to a generalist service, because a generalist can step back, can step back, and see the larger picture from the point of view of the user. And who is the user of government? The user of government is every citizen, you and I and everybody else. Every citizen is the user of government. And in a sense, for example, 
uh, you have the director of a film, a director who makes a film, but very often directors are not good actors themselves, and they don't have to be good actors. If they were excellent actors, they'd be acting in their films themselves. But a director knows whether an actor is acting well or not, and he is able to direct and tell the actor, no, do it again, do it again, and get, and ultimately it is the director who puts together the film, or the conductor of an orchestra. The conductor of an orchestra need not himself be the best pianist or the best violinist or you know the, the, the person who plays the clarinet the best. No. The, these are the are the experts who are doing who are playing these various instruments, but the conductor of the orchestra puts it together and is able then to create the kind of music that will satisfy the audience, who are the consumers of that music. So in a sense, that is the role of the IAS officer, and he is trained for that. He is trained for that from district, right from district administration, because from the time he has been in the district, whether as SBO or as additional collector or as collector, what he is doing is coordinating. There in the district, the IAS officer heads everything, including law and order. Though directly the superintendent of police will be dealing with law and order, but the overall control, particularly the civilian government, is by the collector of the district, the education department, the health department, the PWD, whatever, the irrigation, the agriculture, all these departments, you have the expert officers who are doing their work and doing their work in, 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 in and reporting to their uh, seniors in that, but it is the collector's job to coordinate all that, to bring all that together such that people get a meaningful, valid, efficient administration. That is the job of the collector. And therefore, he is in that sense a generalist and continues when he comes to the secretariat. In my own experience, when I, I uh, uh, joined in, in Madhya Pradesh after my stint in the central government uh, as principal secretary of the Department of Food, and I knew nothing about food. And food in Madhya Pradesh was big because not only was there the, the, the public distribution system, but it also covered, food also covered hugely the procurement of food grains. In Madhya Pradesh, 85 lakh tons of, of wheat is procured, and another 20 lakh tons of, of, uh, of, uh, of um, rice is procured. And Madhya Pradesh itself uses just 25 lakh tons of food grains in its own PDS, and 75 lakh tons of food grains is then given to the country for the PDS or the public distribution system, the ration shops, etc., which go to other states. So there are few states that do this procurement. It comes under the food department, and then of course there is the public distribution system. And we were confronted with many challenges. I am not an IT expert either, not at all. My background is history and political science, but we faced with a challenge, we were able to put together what we called at that time the EU Parjan or the e-procurement system that involved, you know, uh, uh, five lakh farmers registering on computers in their villages in a backward state like Madhya Pradesh, 3,000 procurement centers, we trained people, we trained them in the, in the IT software, we developed the software. And ultimately, this whole system within a year became a model for the country. It became a model for the country. It won two, uh, one national award. The World Bank invited me to make a presentation there. It went on the United Nations, things like that. The point I'm trying to make is that one doesn't have to be an expert in order to be able to put things together. The same thing happened in the Kumbh, the, the Sihas, you know, in Ujjain we have the Kumbh Mela, the Sihat Kumbh, which happens once every 11 years. There are three places in India where the Kumbh Mela takes place. One is Allahabad, which, you know, which happened a few months ago in the middle of COVID. Uh, one is uh, Nashik and one is uh, Ujjain. And the Ujjain Kumbh, was the, it was due to happen in 2016. And I became Chief Secretary in 2013. And, uh, well, you know, people said, you know, my God, the boom is such a sacred thing that is happening. And how will this Christian officer, uh, you know, will he manage the boom? Because the chief secretary was made, the, uh, the committee was set up uh, under the chief secretary and it was an empowered committee and we were given all the powers to 
implement. Uh, and one thing we did was, you know, I saw previous schools and earlier on, they spent three, four hundred crores or five hundred crores making last minute temporary arrangements. And when the poem finishes, all that money is, you know, just on temporary arrangements. So right in 2013, I requested the chief minister. I said, let's not do this. If we are doing so much effort, let's put in money into permanent infrastructure, for which we had to start two and a half years in advance. And there was a budget of 2,000 crores. And from these 2,000 crores, fortunately, the chief minister trusted me. I was head of that committee. And what we did was, over two and a half years, we got all departments to work together. And out of 2,000 crores, only 300 crores was spent on this kind of, uh, you know, temporary arrangements at the end. But 1,700 crores we put into solid infrastructure, working over two and a half years. We built roads, we built four bridges, we built a 400-bedded hospital, we built two hotels, we built a museum. We built all the carts along the along the Shipra River. We cleaned up the Shipra River. We brought water from the Narbada uh, 90 kilometers away to rejuvenate the river. And we designed the system such that after the pump, that same system could be used to irrigate thousands of acres of land. So it was not simply to bring water for the pump to, in, into the Shipra River. So it helped irrigation, agriculture, and everything else. And as I said, roads, hotels, museums, hospitals were all permanent infrastructure. Now, this was, it is officers in their own departments who did the work. But the, the team of IAS officers that I headed are those who put this whole thing together. So a generalist approach to administration, to man management, is something that the IAS is cut out to be. Of course, questions are often asked. If this is the case, then why are we in such a mess? Why isn't everything going well? And it's a valid question, a very true question. But you know, every socially, uh, socially desirable solution, every solution needs to be socially desirable. It also needs to be technically feasible. As we are taught in the academy, it needs to be technically feasible. But many people stop there. They think if something is technologically feasible, it can be done. It should be done. This is technically feasible, do it. Why are they not doing it? But apart from just being socially desirable and technologically feasible, it has to be financially viable. You should be able to afford it. It should be replicable. Because you can't just do it in one place and say, no, it's done and that's the end. Taxes are being collected for the good of everybody. So you should be able, it should be a, a, a cost-effective solution that can be replicated. So that is financial viability. Financial viability is not only can I afford it, but can it be replicated? It has to be judicially tenable. That is, you cannot use illegal means to achieve an end. Because you want to establish law and order, you can't just pick up criminals and shoot them. Because you want to control the population, you can't just catch hold of people and sterilize them. No. There are human rights involved. So the solution has to be judicially tenable. And of course, it also has to be politically acceptable. Now you ask why? Why should it be politically acceptable? All these fellows are chores. No, but we are living in a democracy. And I tell you, a democracy is worth all this. Only people who have not lived in democracies will be able to tell you this. That there is a certain price we pay for living in a democracy. But it is not as though if we were not in a democracy, everything would be hunky-dory. Sometimes people say, why doesn't this country hand it over to, you know, to the army? Let the army run it. But we know countries that are run by the army. We know dictatorships in Latin America. We know our own neighbors in Pakistan. What happened? Sometimes people don't know that's a damn good judgment by the Supreme Court, so, so hand it over to the judges to run. Or let technocrats run, you know. But it doesn't work. Even bureaucrats cannot run this. IAS officers cannot run the country. Ultimately, in a democracy, you have to have the people electing, electing their 
rulers. Yes, the IAS as as the as as a, as, a, as the the head of the administration, the civil service. Their job is to advise, to come up with creative ideas, and to convince the the the, the political executive about the rightness of those ideas. But the ult ultimate judgment is that of the political ex executive. But now, when I say the ultimate judgment, what do I mean about? I, I need to qualify this. The ultimate judgment, provided it is a legal decision. We all know there is a big challenge. There is a challenge of corruption in government. It's not, of course, restricted to the IAS. It goes beyond. Goes everywhere. So, how does an IAS officer face this? All, all, all. all I can say is that if something is, how do you face anything that's wrong? You don't do it. You don't do something that's wrong. After all, what can happen? Yes, you can be transferred. You can face some difficulty. But that is your, that is a professional hazard. Your job, the IAS, gives you so much power, it gives you so much prestige, it gives you so much satisfaction. But along with that, you need to take your professional hazard. An army officer gets, gets, gets so much prestige. They are well paid, they, they have stages. But yet, if there is a war, the professional hazard is fighting in battle and even dying, if you have to. Doctors, if the pandemic happens like it has, doctors have to be in the front line and have to cure patients. This is a professional hazard. And so also, in government, a civil servant has his professional hazard and he has to take it. He has to confront it. He doesn't have to bow to it. But people often ask, you know, whom does the IAS officer serve? And I, I, of course, I, certainly the IAS officer is not the servant of the minister. He is not even the servant of the government, even though technically we refer to government servant. And then people say, you know, so is he the servant of the people? And I say, no. It is the minister who is the servant of the people. The IAS officer, the bureaucracy, is a servant of the constitution. He is a creation of the constitution, and he is a servant of the constitution. And he has to work within the constitutional framework, within the constitutional order. And that is the job of the IAS officer, to work within this constitutional framework. And you know, there is, there is actually, many people imagine that, you know, there's nothing you can do, you have a whole bunch of politicians, but it's not true. Actually, the reputation of an IAS officer precedes him. And if you do what is right, very often you earn the respect of even the politicians. I recall when I was many years ago in the early part of my service, I was additional collector in Bilaspur, now in Chhattisgarh, and there was an MLA over there who wanted, you know, the, the one of the jobs of the additional collector was when when premises, private premises were taken on rent to the government by the government for some school or running some health center or something, some rent had to be fixed by the additional collector. And it, there was one MLA over there, and he wanted a high rent, much higher than the market rent, fixed for his premises. And I refused. And he came and told me, you know, I am the MLA from here, and you know, I want this rent. This, you must fix this high rent. I said, nothing doing. I will fix the market rent, and that market rent will be there. And please, I'm not going to accept your pressure. And I did it. Now, then there were elections, and the, the uh, government came to power, and this gentleman became the speaker of undivided Madhya Pradesh. And I thought, now, this fellow has become speaker, a very powerful post, particularly state like Madhya Pradesh, and I was just a little collector. And heaven knows, you know, what he is going to do. And he will take out his ire. And, um, uh, you know, there was uh, one some incident that took place. Uh, uh, about uh, two MLAs were protesting and something like that. And I had to arrest him. And the, the uh, assembly was in session. Now, arresting MLAs when the assembly is, is in session actually can also become a breach of privilege. So I was worried. And uh, anyway, I called up the, the assembly at that time. They called up the secretariat. And I said, see, I've done this. I've arrested these two MLAs because they are uh, And this speaker, I said, I need to tell the speaker that. Because, and this guy came on the phone. And he said to me, 
I, I told him this is this thing. And he said to me, Nangi Jita sir, please don't worry. Okay. Chinta mat kijiye. Main aapke prashansako mein se ek hai. Which means, I am one among your admirers. And then he told me, when you refused to raise the rent, even though I was trying to pressurize you three years ago, you refused to do that. From that day, I admire you very much. And of course, nothing happened to me after that. So I, what, what, the only reason I'm telling you is this small incident, that actually, if IAS officers do their jobs properly, they even earn respect from, from, from politicians. The, the reputation of an officer is his greatest armor. Because also in today's, in today's uh, uh, atmosphere, when, when, when you know, everything is out on social media, uh, if, 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 if you have a good reputation, it's something that social media will catch immediately. And that becomes, to an extent, your protection. Uh, the IAS has a career choice. Of course, the IAS gives you, like any other service in government, whether it's the IAS, the IPS, or whatever is the service, it gives you job security, tremendous job security. They always say that a civil servant is like a, you know, like a faulty missile. And why is a civil servant like a faulty missile? Because it doesn't work and it can't be fired. So, anyway, uh, l l l let's hope that majority of them work. But the job gives you job security. You get a good house wherever you are. It's a very nominal rent. You get servants. You get a good salary. You begin life. Now, nowadays, after the Seventh Day Commission at about 50, 60,000 rupees, and you go up to about two and a half lakhs when you, when you, when you retire. Of course, when I joined service 41 years ago, the salary was only 1,100 a month, but it was a decent salary even in those days. But now things have improved considerably. It gives you tremendous power and prestige. But I would submit that if, if one is really looking at the IAS as a career choice, it is not power and prestige or job security or the house or the salary or the servant or the chauffeur driven car. That should be your motivation. This is your compensation. But like any other job, like any other career, it should hold your interest. And the reason should be that development excites you. Yes. It, it's good if you have a burning desire to help people, to work for people, but it, you don't necessarily have to be Mother Teresa to join the IAS. But if you, it would be enough if development excites you. Uh, let me just give you what I mean by this. You see, when I was in college, in Prince Asia, I was in a hostel in Mumbai, and there was a, a peanut seller which spells Shengdana outside the college. And where we used to go and we used to buy Shengdana from him and things like that. So we made friends with him, you know, outside we used to go at all times and buy things over there. And, and, and uh, one of the, you know, on, on, on one occasion he looked very worried. And I, I asked him, I said, what's up, like, you know, what's the problem? And he said, you know, I have a... Uh, uh, you know, I don't want to spend my life only selling Shengdana. I want to start a little shop where I stay in some slum area. But I have a small plot of land there. And the municipal corporation has come and dumped its stuff, like, a, you know, dumped some of its uh, material over there. And I can't get that piece of land, and so I cannot start my shop. So I need to tell them to, you know, get the stuff off. So I said, OK, I'll help you. I mean, why, I, mean why, I said, why don't you go and give an application? And he said, you know, I can't read and this. I said, no, no, I'll write out your application for you. And I wrote out an application, I told him, I wrote out an application. And I told him, you go to the municipal corporation and you give it. So he went. And then he told me the next day that I've given it. A week passed, two weeks passed, three weeks passed. And I, whenever I went there to ask him, you know, has your job been done? And he said, no, sir, nothing has happened. Yeah. No one has come. So I said, you must remind them. And he said, I've gone there. I will remind them. I'll remind them again. And anyway, I also forgot about this. 
and he, I, I don't know what happened then. But after about three months, uh, when I went there, he was looking extremely depressed. And I said, you know, what happened? And he held up a paper and showed it to me. And it was the same paper that I had written the application on. So it was my handwriting and I said to him, you haven't given, uh, you didn't give your application. He said, of course I gave it. And I looked at the paper and right enough on the, in the margins there are a whole lot of markings. The municipal commissioner had marked it to an additional commissioner, an additional commissioner and marked the paper to someone and someone and someone. It had gone right through. And this fellow told, well, this fellow did not read, so he couldn't understand what was written at the side of the paper. But he said, sir, every six months from the municipal corporation, they sell raddi. And I go and buy raddi because I tie monkey nuts in the raddi. And in the raddi that I bought, I recognized this paper. And it shocked me. It shocked me at that time. And I said, how can there be such a, you know, forget inefficiency. How can there be such a lack of sensitivity? This man's paper went round and went, did all kinds of rounds and finally was sold back to him as Ratti. And that sort of, uh, you know, sort of, that was one of the things that excited me. I said, this kind of thing can't happen. Because before that, I had always wanted to join the, you know, the foreign service, the diplomacy, sort of uh, the glamour of diplomacy, uh, sort of, I, I was uh, quite fascinated with. But then I realized that, you no. Know, uh, it is the IAS that I should be actually joining because this is going to be far more exciting, far more challenging. And uh, yeah, so this is what, uh, you know, uh, so, so I, I, I would say the IAS should be a career choice if it is development that excites you. And you will have a lot of opportunities. I mean, the IAS is one kind of job that gives you variety. You know, it, it, it's not that you're just doing one thing. One day you may be in the health department, uh, later on you may be in the education department, uh, subsequently you may be in atomic energy, or you can be in the IT department. So it gives a huge amount of variety. It gives you opportunity to travel. It gives you, you can even take leave and you can study abroad for up to two years, paid leave. So it, 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 it uh, and in spite of whatever, what things people say, you have the opportunity also to express your creativity and innovation. Now, I, I, I've been told there are only five minutes left. The rest of the questions I will answer uh, uh, in the, uh, if, if there are questions relating to them. But I will in this last five minutes just cover a little bit about the examination. Now, the examination to the IAS is not difficult. It is the process that is difficult. And why do I say this? Because in the IS, there's no such thing as getting 60% or getting 80% or getting 20%. It is a competitive exam. You have to get more than somebody else gets. Whether if, some, if you get 41%, you'll still be selected if the others get below, you get below 40. But even if you get 80%, you won't be selected if someone else gets 81%. So basically, you have to get more than others. It's a competitive exam. And the numbers are a little bit uh, intimidating because about 10 lakh people actually apply each year and about 6 lakh actually take the exam. And ultimately, from all these, about there's a preliminary exam first. Uh, about 10,000 are selected then for the main exam, and of which about 3,000 are called for interview and ultimately you know, in the IAS, about 100 odd are selected, and the others are selected for other services. It's the same exam. It's the same exam for the three All of India services, which are the IAS, the police service, the IPS. Uh, it's the same exam. And then there are the, uh, the, the forest service has a little different exam because they also have papers in botany and zoology. Uh, and then there are all the central services, which are not tada based services, which include the foreign service, then there is the customs and excise, the revenue service, the income tax, there is the railway traffic service, there is the postal service, there is the audit and account service. There are 24 such services. So depending on your rank, you can get selected. Uh, and so altogether each year about 700, 800 class one officers are selected to the government. But the, you have to be among the first 100 or so if you want to opt for the IAS, which is generally the first choice. The minimum age is 21 years, and you have to be a graduate. In 
any stream. You know, you get the, and, and you don't have to be a first class in your graduation. You can even be a third class in your graduation. In any stream, 21 years is the minimum age, and the maximum age is 32 years it's for general candidates, 35 for OBCs, and 37 years for STSDs. But this is only to get in. A retirement age is 60 for everybody. So the later you get in, uh, well, you're in, but then it creates problems uh, when you in your promotions because you, you find it difficult to reach the topmost, you retire before you can reach the topmost. Because even though there are age relaxations for various categories to enter service, there is no age relaxation for retirement. At 60, everybody retires. In the preliminary exam, there are two papers. One is general studies, which covers things like current affairs, history, geography, and things, you know. And one is aptitude, where, which, where your, your comprehension, interpersonal skills, logical reasoning, decision making. Now, the aptitude, you have to only qualify, get 33%. Based on your marks in your general studies, which is a multiple choice with negative marking, you then go to the mains. Yes, in the mains, that is a little tough. There are nine papers, one paper in English and one paper in any Indian language you like. You can choose anything. Konkani is also one of them. Hindi, whatever you like. There are all the languages under the Constitution, 17, 18 of them are all there. So English and one language paper you have to take. Then there is an essay paper, which you can choose to write in any language. It's a single paper, single essay, but that's very important. And then there are four general study papers, one on history and culture, one on polity, one on economy and environment, and one on ethics. Now, these are actually 12th standard level, but, but uh, you know, uh, the answers are not like in the 12th standard. And then there are two subjects which you choose. Again, you can choose any subject. They need not be the subjects in which you graduated. You can choose engineering, history, political science, sociology, anthropology. You can take one science subject, one art subject. You can do whatever you like, but two subjects. And then if you, in these nine, two papers are qualifying, the two language papers, but the seven papers, your score is added. And if you then fall within the top 3,000, you get called for an interview. The interview is as an interview panel which, as I say, details of this and all we can do in another session for those who are interested. And then your interview marks are added to your written marks, and then if you qualify, the, the, the results are nice. I think I have taken 45 minutes, so, you know, if, if I have been a bit disjointed, I beg your pardon, but if there is anything else you want to ask, it can come up in the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deepa. Your presentation was very clear. Uh, very informative, and you put the thought as the challenges and the hazards of the profession. I wish I heard this talk earlier, I might have joined the IAS. <laughs> because we really have no clear understanding of what the IAS, and I'm sure many, many young people are in a similar situation. And it's good to hear uh, from somebody who has been in it, has risen in that profession, and has contributed a great deal. In fact, uh, there was an IAS officer here whom uh, we had as an education secretary, and he was so knowledgeable, uh, he could take on any kind of a portfolio. And they, I, I, I imagine you have to study a lot before you deal with an institution, which requires to be, uh, you to be men of knowledge and integrity. So it was a pleasure listening to you, and uh, I'm sure there will be many questions for you. Uh, but thank you for this very clear presentation. Are there any questions? Uh, there's a question here. What are the systems in place which allow IAS officers to function effectively without undue interference from minister? I think I've come to the position sir. So the systems in place are this. One is that there are constitutional provisions and you have that kind of protection. Nobody can throw you out of, of your job. Yes, you can be transferred. And if you are transferred, you are transferred fine. What is the problem? You, 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 are, you, you know, you, you've not come into the service uh, or you do not have a birthright to have a particular post or to stay in one ministry, uh, you know, um, all your life or as long as you want to. So if you are transferred, you are
the transfer. But you cannot be thrown out of service without due process being adopted. And there is proper due process. You will be given a show cause notice. We have an opportunity to reply. And uh, there, you know, a departmental inquiry would be held by a senior officer. And so if you've done nothing wrong, uh, I don't think you should have anything to fear. It is not It is not that honest officers don't get victimized. They do. But then you tell me any other profession in this country where there are not these as like professional hazards. They happen everywhere. They happen in the private sector too. Now, so those are risks you take. But as I say, the, 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 the transparency that has gradually coming in to government uh, even under the Right to Information Act, uh, these all form levels of protection for an officer. But the officer also has to be prepared to face some amount of dislocation uh, for his principles. Like, as I say, it's not just in the IAS, it is in any other uh, area of, uh, of uh, you know, any other career that you choose, wherever you may choose them. You always have to face some amount of, uh, of, of pressure in order to stick by your principles. But it is not that you will be thrown out of your job or something like that. Thank you. I suppose there are other questions that have come in. Uh, Mr. The next question is, uh, how do we prepare for answering the entrance exam for the IAS? See, uh, when, you, when, when, I, when you say the entrance exam, I assume, I assume you are referring at this stage to the preliminary exam. You know, not the main where there are nine papers, but the preliminary exam which has two papers. Uh, one is an aptitude test, one is a general knowledge test. Just like you prepare for any other general knowledge examination, you have to prepare for this. In the sense that one thing is you have to be up to date with current affairs. Current affairs are the most important thing, both nationally and internationally. So you have to read the newspapers. You have to watch the news. I used to say watch the news only on TV, but these days even I've stopped watching TV news because it's deteriorated hugely. But read the newspapers. And when I say read the newspapers, I, do, I don't mean only the news columns. Yes, the news columns, but also the editorials the center page articles, uh, you have to read this. You have to read two or three international magazines, either Time, Newsweek, The, 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 the uh, Economist. Uh, some of all this keeps you up to date with what is happening. One part is current affairs, economy, and the other part is history, culture. But these are just actually 12th standard level. You pick up any 12th standard textbook of history culture, go through it, and uh, yes, that's how you prepare for yourself. I think uh, the next question is talking about uh, explaining again the nine papers. But I think uh, if anybody is really interested in this, they could look up uh, for information on the net and get this information. One of the questions says here, did you get through in the first attempt? If not, how did persistence help you directly or indirectly on the field? I'm not so uh, Sister, can you just repeat the question, please? Did you get through in the first attempt? If not, how did this persistence help you directly or indirectly on the field? See, no, no. See, uh, persistence is, is always valuable. And uh, the opportunity that you can sit for the exam if you want six times. Uh, but my, my, in my time, you could only sit thrice. Now they've increased it to six. But my advice always, always to any aspirant to the IAS or any of the civil services is, listen, give it your best. But you must have, you know, uh, an alternative career choice. And, you know, I've even sat, by, the UPSC has invited me to sit on interview boards, interviewing young officers, uh, aspirants, and I frequently ask them the question, okay, you sat for the exam, but what are you doing at the moment? And I get very disappointed when people say, you know, I'm not doing anything, I'm just studying for the exam. 
And I think this is a horrible thing to do. I mean, you've reached a level when you're 23, 24 years old, 25 years or whatever, you, however old you are after your graduation, post-graduation. And still, you are living on your parents' money. You shouldn't be doing that. Also, I think that does not widen your scope. Uh, what I did was after I, I post-graduated, I began lecturing. And I was earning my own money as a lecturer in Bombay. And uh, I felt that it also helped me study, widen my horizons. So I would advise that if you are preparing for the exam, you must uh, do something else also where you are earning. And fine, you try a couple of times. And if, say, by your third attempt, even you can't get in, perhaps the civil services is not the career for you. So uh, uh, you can be persistent twice or thrice and then uh, still if you don't get in i would suggest you know scrap it don't waste your time not doing anything and only studying for the exam and sitting for six attempts i mean you will ruin your life if you do that question is uh, what about lateral entry i is it the need of the what about lateral entry lateral entry see lateral entry uh, is something that has been introduced about three or four years ago. But lateral entry now there are, uh, is uh, where people come in from the private sector, but they don't come in. In lateral entry, you can't come into the IAS. What you do is jobs that are held by the IAS at joint secretary level in the government of India are offered to lateral entrants few of them, about six or seven or eight. So you come in as a joint secretary, you do your job for three or four years, and then you go back to the private sector. But you're never part of the IAS. Yes, now, if unless you were referring to promotions. If you are referring to promotions, then yes, the IAS, it consists of two-thirds of direct recruits that are people who come in by this UPSC examination, and about one-third of, of each state cadre People get into the IS through promotion. That is, they join as deputy collectors in a class two service from the state civil service exam, through the state civil service exam. And the state civil service exam can recruit you as deputy collectors for your state. But there is a promotion quota and you get this promotion. The only disadvantage to this is that this promotion comes after about you've spent about 15 to 20 years in the state civil service and when you come into the IAS you get an advantage of only three or four years of seniority with the result that you retire and as I say retirement age across the board is the same so again you retire at a level which is high because every post in the IAS is a high post but it may not be at the topmost level it may not be as chief secretary uh, of a state or secretary to government of India in a particular ministry. They are at the same level, secretary of uh, uh, to, to, to a ministry in government of India and chief secretary of a large state, not Goa. Goa, the level is additional uh, secretary level, but other states are the, the... So that is the only disadvantage. But otherwise, for all practical purposes, you are an IAS officer, even when you get promoted. One more question, there's one more question. After clearing the state PSC at the Fourth Public Service Commission exam, is it possible to get promoted as an IAS officer? I have just answered this question. Yes, if you are selected in the PSC and and you are working in the in the in the uh, state government, it is possible after about twelve to fifteen years to be promoted into the IAS. Of course, what is also open to you is, provided you have not crossed the age limit, to sit for the exam again. You can sit for the IAS directly and get selected again. But if you have missed that, and the age limit uh, level is, is, you know, is close to you now, you, you can get promoted. And there are people, every year, three, four people in each state do get promoted into the IAS. Well, one third, as I say, 4,000 IAS officers in the country of these 4,000 officers, only about 2,800 are direct recruits, and about 1,200 of them are promoted from their various states. 
just another question. What is, when is it best to start preparing for the examination? Before graduation or after the completing your graduation? See, I would always advise you uh, that you need to make this choice during your graduate, that is before you graduate. Because for the principal reason that I, I would always advise you shouldn't be wasting your time. That is, if you are going to decide after graduation, then what are you going to do? Are you going to sit at home and study again? No, so you will, you, you have to make up your mind. You don't have to start preparing for it. You see, preparing for this exam is like any other exam. And frankly, to my mind, I think six months of preparation is more than adequate. If, if as a graduate student, you have not been bunking all your classes, you may have bunked some of them, but you've not been bunking all your classes, you have studied for your graduation, you have secured a good score. And even though graduation is the minimum requirement, my advice always is that if, if you have not taken a professional degree, that is, if you have not done medicine or engineering, or law, then I would advise that you need, if you've just done a BA or a BSc, then you should do a post-graduation. You should do an MA or an MSc. Not because it's required, but because it will help you develop yourselves in, in, in order to be able to Not answer those papers. But actually, Six months of solid preparation is adequate for the exams and for the preliminaries, even less than that. But you have to be constantly aware. It's not taking a book and just reading a book like that. You have to be aware. You have to be, you know, reading newspapers, magazines, having discussions with people, knowing what is happening in the world. That is important. Uh, another one is, uh, what should be the strength and weaknesses of an honorable IAS officer. What should be his strengths or weaknesses? I mean, uh, uh, of an, I, I assume after the service, after getting into the service, right? Uh, well, your, your, your strength should always be integrity, honesty, a commitment to hard work, a commitment to people, and humility. I believe these are the strengths of a good officer. They will take you far. If you are not humble, if you think you've got into the IS and so you know everything that's happening, you are not going to go very far. Nobody will, as I say, you are in the IAS, you are coordinating other departments. That doesn't mean that doctors in the health department and engineers in the PW know nothing and that you know more than them. You don't. They are technically more knowledgeable than you. Teachers in the education department know more than you. You are there to assist them to look at the big picture and to put it all together. So you have to always have an attitude of humility and an attitude of trying to learn, willing to work hard, willing to devote yourself to the job. And of course, as I say, always honesty and integrity. These are the plus points. What should be the weakness of an IS officer? I don't, I don't think anyone should have a weakness, not just IS officers, nobody. We all have our weaknesses. Everybody has a weakness. But we, we, we should try and overcome those weaknesses naturally. And whatever it is, the, our weakness should not be dishonesty or a lack of integrity or a lack of ethics. That at least should not be the weakness. All right. Uh, I think these other questions uh, are uh, difficult. I mean, I don't know if it's worth putting them up. So what subject should one choose for the bachelor's degree? You already explained that you could have a bachelor's degree in any stream. Any stream, any stream, and you and you can choose different papers for the IASOs. You don't have to choose the same stream. All right. Uh, any more questions? Anyone raising their hand? No. There's a question over here, which I can see. How can you can you prepare without guidance or coaching? See, uh, without coaching, certainly you can prepare. I prepared without coaching. I know many people who have prepared without coaching. Guidance. Certainly, you can look for guidance. You can get guidance from other, uh, uh, you know, IAS officers, uh, IPS officers, senior officers in other services. As I said, there are 24 services, all the same exam. You don't have to sit for separate exam, whether it's income tax, whether it is customs, audit and accounts. So you can approach these officers 
and you can ask for guidance i am willing on a one to one basis to help anyone who's seriously interested in uh, in getting into the ias give you guidance yes coaching is not required if you're willing to work hard coaching is not required thank you uh, mr disa for your offer to help people who need help uh, are there any more questions or should be wind up Nizar Karwalo has raised a hand. Can we have more questions? Good evening, sir. Yes, sir. I have one question. Uh, what are all the books should be studied for physics in UPSC, and how can I refer question banks for it? Uh, I am afraid I am not qualified to give you that answer because I did not take physics really, uh, and 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 uh, you know I mean. Uh, but i would say it will apply to physics as it would apply to any other subject which is the standard books for your graduation for anyone who is graduating in physics you have to go to a physics professor and you if you graduated in physics i assume that you are taking physics because you've graduated in it the standard books that are used for a graduation will be the books that you need to use okay uh uh i'm uh, the next question is i'm currently focusing on the indian foreign services what are the ranking requirements what are the ranking requirements now uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the first choice of people is generally the ias then followed by the ips and the foreign service which means basically you need to come within the first 200 ranks maximum i would say 150 to be on the safe side you have to come within the first 150 to then get a choice to the ias ips or or the foreign service if you don't belong to a reserved category and if you belong to the reserved category then maybe the top 500 you have to come in to be able to qualify uh, this one more question sir uh, can you please uh, give your email id so people can contact you for guidance My email ID is Anthony Desa. dot i a s. Anthony Desa spelled A N T H O N Y D E S A. dot i a s at gmail. dot com. Thank you so much. Um, There, Frederick has put it up. <laughs> Frederick is very quick. I must say, <laughs> I don't think uh, there are any more questions coming up. So. Uh, I, uh, maybe we we'll close the session. There's one more question. Are we going to have another session on the preparation for IAS? Another session on the preparation for IAS. That is a question that you will have to ask uh, the organizers, <laughs> not me. I'm always willing to help, but uh, the organizers have to decide that. So the okay. friends of the Jesuits who started this, Father Mervyn, Frederick, whoever is organizing this, uh, you, I really don't know, will have to decide that. Ah, uh, this is this the administration said we'll be letting you know know soon. Uh, Someone asked for tips for interview, etc. All this will have to be in another session. Actually, you can't just have, you know, I mean, interview will have to be a whole other session, totally. <laughs> I think we've had a very interesting session. I must say, um, uh, sir, that it was a pleasure. Listening to you and your clarity of thought, the history of the whole IAS services, you you outline it so beautifully, and the the tips you have given our young people. Uh, thank you very much, and I must say that the uh, admin team did well by selecting you for the inaugural session. It has stimulated a lot of thinking and a lot of questions, and uh, I'd like to end with congratulating. uh this uh, the jesuit province and the and their friends for thinking up such an idea like a collaborative learning cafe and as usual the jesuits normally find very catchy titles for their programs when you think of a cafe you think of coffee day so it stimulates people to want to be part of such a program so thank you to one and all and god bless you thank you How do we take out?